we have finally, finally arrived at the one commandment that most of us, most of us can say we haven't broken. Now, if you have broken this commandment in a literal sense, don't tell me, because then I'll be obligated to report you, and I don't want to know. What I don't know can't hurt me, but I'm assuming that for most of us, we have finally arrived at the one commandment. We might be able to look at the other commandments and see ways in which we have violated that commandment, broken that commandment, but we finally get to one where we are all pretty confident that we haven't broken. I mean, week after week, I have annoyed you by showing you how each commandment demands far more from us than we might think, and it exposes us far more thoroughly than we could imagine. But here, finally, a straightforward, no-nonsense command that we're sure we have not broken. Okay, so when, when I was a kid uh, and I was caught doing something bad, I, would, I can remember, I would typically defend myself by saying to my mom or my dad or both, well, at least I haven't killed anybody. Okay, as if my parents would then say, you know what, you're right. So what that you skipped school? It doesn't matter. You haven't killed anybody. Go out and have fun, okay? Uh, I mean, that was sort of my defense, and we have probably said that, all of us, on a variety of different occasions, if not with our mouth, and at least in our minds, when we have done something foolish, when we have done something stupid, when we have gotten ourselves into a mess, we, we find this self-defense mechanism going off inside of us that says, well, at least, at least we haven't killed anybody. I mean, we use our keeping of this commandment as a defense for our not-so-badness, because so many of us are so utterly dependent on thinking that we are better than we are if we aren't going to live in a state of despair. We have to, at the very least, compare ourselves to other people to assure ourselves that we're, we're not that bad, or at the very least, there are people who are worse than us. I mean, I may not be perfect, but at least I can point to some people that are worse than I am. This is the first commandment we typically think of when we are desperate to feel decent about ourselves. I may be guilty of lying, I may be guilty of cheating, but I'm no murderer. So there's a sense in which this commandment might sound like good news to us because we can conclude we're not guilty of this one. Therefore, at least here, at this particular point, we're innocent. We're not guilty of this one, so we can read it, and something that is intended at first to sound like bad news, convicting all of us and rendering all of us guilty, sounds like good news. At least we're, n we're not guilty of this one. I mean, I can look at the others and find myself guilty at some level when it comes to keeping those commandments, but when it comes to this one, I'm innocent. Uh, but as it turns out, this commandment might actually expose us more not less than any of the others. And all you have to do in order to see this is to flip forward to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. There were those in Jesus' day as well who found themselves concluding that when it came to this commandment at least, they were innocent. They found themselves feeling quite proud somewhat self-righteous of the fact that when it came to killing someone else, when it came to murder, they were not guilty of this particular demand from God, this particular commandment. But Jesus says otherwise, beginning in verse 21, and I mentioned the first week that we started this series, that if we were going to properly understand how to read the Ten Commandments, we had to go toward, we had to go forward to Jesus' interpretation of God's law, which we find in the first part of the Sermon on the Mount. And here, Jesus says in verse 21, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Now, Jesus here 
radically intensifies this commandment to not murder by three times. Just in case you don't get it as he describes it the first time, he describes it in three different ways and he intensifies it as he goes on. Jesus shows that keeping this command extends to what goes on inside of us. It's not only external actions, but internal feelings and motives that God takes into account. It's not just, well, I didn't kill anybody. I didn't actually stab someone or shoot someone. I didn't actually murder anybody. Therefore, I am successful in keeping this commandment. Jesus takes it deeper. He presses it even further in. You see, human defense systems live by the thought-action distinction. And let me explain what I mean by that. Our, our defense mechanism, whether you realize it or not, we have these internal defense mechanisms because we're fallen, broken people that actually live by what therapists call the thought-action distinction. Therapists are always telling patients that it's okay to have the thought so long as the thought doesn't lead to the act. So in a sense, it's okay to envision yourself killing someone as long as you don't actually do it. As long as, I mean, gosh, we're not perfect. Um, I mean, we all have anger issues and frustration issues. We're all broken people living with other broken people. Anger, in a sense, is unavoidable. Just don't act on it. Don't act on it. If you, if you think to yourself, I wish this person were dead, at least don't act on it. I mean, it's not that the thought in and of itself is a good thought, but don't act on it. And as long as you can live by this thought-action distinction, you can actually conclude that thinking it is not nearly as bad as actually doing it. I mean, wanting to kill someone is one thing, but actually killing someone is another matter altogether. Only in the eyes of the state, not in the eyes of God. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Jesus eliminates this defense mechanism that we have so astutely developed over time between the thought and act, between thoughts and actions. And Jesus insists here that anger and murder are equally liable to judgment and hell. He shows that in God's economy, there is an equality between intention and action, thought and deed. And the thought-deed distinction is a clever defense mechanism, which actually works to prevent us from seeing how bad we really are. We all do this. We all do it. You may not realize you do this. I may not realize that I do this, but we all, we all do this. We develop this internal defense mechanism, this thought-action defense mechanism. It's a very, very clever thing. It's remarkably clever as we develop this defense mechanism that gets us believing that if we think it but don't do it, we're not that bad. I mean, we're not innocent. We're clearly imperfect, but we're not that bad. And this works with us for a while. We start, to, we start to believe that there are people on death row who have actually murdered other people who are worse than we are. Jesus is not saying that thinking about killing and actually killing is the same in the eyes of the state. We know it's not. But he's saying it is equal in the eyes of God. Don't think you're keeping this commandment if you don't murder anybody, it goes deeper than that. And then he really does, um, he really does intensify it even more. I mean, the point is that the equalization of thought and action leaves us with nowhere to run and nowhere to hide and places every single one of us on the same playing field. It puts us all on the same playing field. It levels the playing field. But even if that wasn't bad enough, he takes it up a notch. It's not just anger, it's any kind of insult, he says. Spoken or unspoken, any kind of insult. It's not just anger. We might be able to go along with the idea that, okay, I, and listen, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but no one in this room, no one who's listening, no one who's watching, no one in this room, no one has never thought they want someone dead. No one. Okay, now, you may have gotten so holy and pious in the later years of your life that you can't remember, but I can promise you, at the very least, when you were a kid, 
if you were ever bullied, if there was ever someone you didn't like, at some point in your life, you have wished someone to be dead. At some point. At some point in your life, you have thought to yourself, my life would be so much better if that person was dead. And if you've really been upset because this person has mistreated you, you've actually envisioned yourself killing that person, okay? Now, you laugh, but I've envisioned killing lots of people, okay? Like envisioned it. In fact, there are some people in, you know, way long time ago, I've never thought that, I haven't thought that as a grown-up, mature, holy adult, but long, long, long time ago, um, I mean, I can remember thinking, I don't just want that person dead, I want to kill them. I want to feel the satisfaction of killing them myself, okay? You know, the, the bullies. You, I mean, I'm one of seven kids. I've wished at one point in time every single one of my brothers and sisters dead at some point in time growing up. I mean, I, I just, you, you know, if you've, I've, I can remember wishing my mom and dad were dead. Um, I mean, I, every single person in this room, at the very least, has wished someone were dead. Well, Jesus takes it up a notch, and he says it's not just that, okay? It's not just anger and frustration, wanting someone else dead. It's not just anger, it's any kind of insult. Any kind of insult, spoken insult or unspoken insult. And then notice what he does here. He takes intention out of it. So even unintentional insulting is a breaking of this commandment unintentional insulting. It's not just insulting someone. It's, it can also include unintentional insulting. I mean, how many of us have insulted someone without even intending to? Okay, well, too bad. Guilty. Okay, I mean, how many, how many of us have insulted someone in our heart, even if we have been restrained enough not to speak it with our mouth? How many of us have insulted someone with our mouth intentionally? How many of us have insulted someone with our mouths unintentionally? But that's not the way I meant it. Okay, Jesus says, too bad. You're guilty. Any kind of insult, any kind of insult, spoken or unspoken, intentional or unintentional. But amazingly, Jesus isn't done Okay, if that doesn't level all of us, anger, insulting, intentional insulting, unintentional insulting, insulting someone with our mouth, or just simply insulting someone in our minds without even speaking it with our mouth, if that doesn't level the playing field and expose all of us, he takes it even deeper. He takes it up even a notch higher. Let's look at the last part of verse 22. And whoever says, you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Now, with these words, Jesus has expanded the guilty to include even the least offenders. Who of us is innocent of, at the very least, thinking someone is a fool? I mean, just thinking someone is a fool. Okay, whether you even say you're a fool, okay, which I've said 10 trillion times with my mouth a variety of different people in my life. But what about just thinking someone's a fool? Okay, now we can say, but, and I thought about this yesterday, um, the, the Bible itself calls people fools, okay? I mean, you can go back to Proverbs. Proverbs describes foolish people. Yes, that is a result of the fall of sin and brokenness breaking into our world. It is, it is a revealer of our imperfection, our imperfection, the imperfection of others, uh, the imperfection of our world, and that's the problem. In order to keep this command, it has to be kept perfectly. So there should be no fools in a perfect world, and without any fools, there should be no feeling in me that you are a fool, or no feeling in you that you are, no feeling in you that I am a fool. There would be no foolishness in this world. That's the point. He's exposing imperfection across the board and saying, even those of you who think someone's a fool, even those of you who um, speak that someone's a fool or think someone's a fool, um, you, you get hell. That's what you get. That's the payment. I mean, the punishment for just thinking someone is a fool, according to Jesus, is eternal damnation. So, 
the most minor offenders get the worst punishment. And this is what's so fascinating to me about this. Um, the fact that any of us are able to function or sleep at all. The fact that, the fact that all of us are not in an insane asylum okay, that we're actually able to function at some level proves that we don't believe what he's saying is here is true about us. I mean, if we really, really understood the weightiness of the guilt that we own and the payment for that guilt that we deserve, I mean, we would, we would be insane. We would crawl up in a fetal position in a room and suck our thumbs the rest of our lives. We wouldn't want to go out in public. We wouldn't want to see people. We wouldn't want people to see us. I mean, Jesus takes it up a notch big time. And this is what I mean when I say that the problem in the church is not cheap grace, it's cheap law. It's cheapening God's demands, cheapening God's requirements to something that we can do, something that we can pull off. And so we develop this distinction that I mentioned a few minutes ago where we say, okay, well, I get it. Um, killing is bad. You know, it, to deal with this commandment on a surface level, I could talk about capital punishment. I could talk about abortion. I could talk about this, that, or the other. That, that doesn't hit you and me necessarily right where it hurts. But this is intended to hit you and me right where it hurts. That every single one of us is guilty. And the fact, the fact that we are even able to function proves that at some level we've cheapened the law and we have developed the law into something smaller, something more achievable than it actually is. That the law requires perfection. This commandment isn't just a commandment which demands we don't kill anybody. It's a demand that we never get angry at our brother that, or sister or wish them dead. That we never insult someone either intentionally or unintentionally. That we never say that someone's a fool or even think that someone's a fool. I mean, this just ridiculously levels us. And that's what Jesus' intention is here. He wants us to see that we are all guilty. Because as I said in my prayer a few minutes ago, we will never, ever, ever hear the good news for ourselves if we don't first come face to face with the bad news about ourselves. You see, um, I mean, when we find ourselves saying, yes, grace, but, it reveals that we're not taking the law as seriously as Jesus took it. When we find ourselves going, okay, I get it. Yes, grace, but, I go, no, hold on a second. You, did you hear how you have been described? Do you hear what you deserve? Do you hear the mess that you've gotten yourself into? It's much, much graver. It's much, much worse than you think it is because if you really, truly understood the depth of your depravity and need, you would never, ever say something so foolish, whoops, as yes, grace, but. You would see God's grace as your only hope, your only lifeline, something that you can never, ever, ever be reminded of and hear too much about. God's grace becomes the only thing that gives us life because if this is true about us, if this is true about us, then we are without hope in this world and the next because when we hear this commandment in its full-throated judgment, we cannot help but be left with only one conclusion. Murderers are not some tiny subset of the population to be kept safely tucked away in a maximum security prison. The sixth commandment breaks down the prison walls not to let the murderers out but to expand the prison. We're all murderers, if not by deed, then at least by thought and word. So, once again, um, if we take this seriously, we find ourselves before God exposed, naked with nothing to call our own but guilt, with nothing to contribute but sin, 
But as I mentioned, you can never, ever, ever hear and experience the amazing good news that I'm about to give you if you're not first coming face to face with just how bad you and I really, really are. Because once again, what we are incapable of doing, what we are incapable of keeping, what we are incapable of accomplishing, God has done for us. The demand maker became the demand keeper to save us demand breakers. That's one way to just simply describe the gospel. The demand maker became a demand keeper to rescue us, to free us, to save us demand breakers. As Jesus hung on the cross, think about his life for a moment. As Jesus hung on the cross, he was, he was mocked. He saved others. Why can't he save himself? If he really is the son of God, he would come down from that cross. Mocked, and this is after he had been unjustly accused, beaten, made fun of, nailed to a cross, and if that wasn't bad enough, as he hangs there gasping for breath, naked, bloodied, he's mocked at the foot of the cross. People mocking him, laughing at his execution. Uh, I mean, it's one thing not to retaliate when you're outmanned and underpowered, okay? It's one thing if you are outmanned and you're underpowered not to retaliate. That's just called wisdom, okay? Um, I mean, if something bad has happened to you and you are clearly outmanned and you are clearly outpowered uh, or underpowered, uh, then not retaliating makes sense. But Jesus could have obliterated the enemy with one word. If you just go back one day from this experience. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. The soldiers come. Judas betrays him with a kiss. The soldiers come to arrest him. Peter, who was so brash and bold about how they would take Jesus over his dead body, over his dead body. There is no way that he would ever desert Jesus. There is no way that he would never defend Jesus. And so the soldiers come, and Judas, Jesus' supposed friend, he knows what it feels like to be stabbed in the back by someone he loved. When Hebrew says he was tempted in all ways as we are, yet was without sin, that he is our great high priest, he has experienced everything we have ever experienced. Think about his friend, his friend who he loved and his friend who he gave his life for, his friend who he fed and all of these things betrays him with a kiss for 30 pieces of silver. Peter retaliates, grabs his knife, cuts off Malchus's ear. Jesus, Jesus picks up the ear, puts it back on his face and says, Peter, are you not, I mean, are you not aware that I could summon legions of it? I don't need you and your steak knife, man. I mean, I could summon legions of angels. And by healing Malchus's ear, Jesus is saying, winning this battle involves killing, involves dying, not killing. Unlike so many of us in the way that we think, winning this battle involves losing. It involves loving and forgiving, not, not killing. He had every opportunity to give into a murderous rage, and we, he would have been justified in doing so. I mean, God was being mocked. Jesus would have been fully, perfectly justified to call on that legion of angels to come to his defense and obliterate the enemy once and for all, which he could have done, and would have been justified in doing so. The God of the universe was being mocked by those he created was being made fun of, was being unjustly accused. He was arrested, he was tortured, he was mocked for being innocent. He had every reason and right in the world to be angry, to insult, to call these people fools, to retaliate, to take care of business God's way. I'm gonna kill you all. He could have easily, easily d done that, but how does he respond? How does Jesus respond to his mockers, to his torturers? How does Jesus respond to his executors, his enemies? He cries out from the cross as he's being insulted, as he's being mocked. Okay, I mean, just kicked while he was down. 
And he prays and says, Father, forgive them. They have no idea what they're doing. For, forgive them. Not strike them dead. I'm begging you to strike them dead, especially that one over there. Just, I mean, he's such a loud, obnoxious jerk. Just that one. Forgive the rest. Strike. I mean, he had, literally, he had every right and reason in the world. And how does he respond? Antithetical to the way that you and I respond, at least in our hearts. He says to the ones who have hurt him, betrayed him, he says about Peter. I mean, this is just, just glorious. I mean, you know, fast forward um, past the resurrection, and Jesus has a number of days before he ascends back to the Father. Peter, who has denied him three times. I don't know if there's anything worse than denying Jesus three times. The guy who said, I will defend you to the death and I will never turn my back on you. A few days later, denies him. Surely you were with him, weren't you? As Jesus is being, Jesus is being tortured, beaten. Soldiers, the people in the crowd, look at Peter who had sort of followed closely behind, was watching this. I mean, forget the fact that he wasn't like throwing himself in front of Jesus and himself being tortured for doing so. He was sort of, you know, laying low in the background. And as people saw him, they said, I think you were with him, weren't you? Aren't you one of his buddies? Aren't you one of his disciples? And three times, three times, Peter says, are you nuts? I don't, I don't even know this guy. Who is this guy? I don't even know who he is. And if you've ever seen the Campus Crusade movie, uh, Jesus... That one scene, I remember seeing it when I was a kid, that one scene after Peter's third denial and the, the cock crows three times and Jesus looks from across the courtyard and catches Peter's eye. And Jesus had told Peter earlier, before the night's over, you're going you're gonna to deny me. Peter was like, no way. <laughs> There's no way. What? You're nuts. And he does. And he runs out weeping. Jesus dies. And he's resurrected from the dead, and he meets Peter on the beach one morning for breakfast after Peter had spent a night fishing. And three times, three times, Jesus says, do you love me? Three times, three times, one for each denial. Peter says, you know I do. And what does Jesus do at that point? I mean, he could have given him a lecture on the beach. I told you. I mean, I told you 24 hours earlier that you were going to deny me, and you were so brash and so bold, and so I would never deny you. Where were you when I needed you most, man? I mean, let this sink in, learn your lesson, and don't ever do it again. That could have been his sermon to Peter on the beach that morning. It wasn't. Do you love me? Yes. Feed my sheep. Peter's ministry is commenced after his greatest failure commenced. He was useless before he failed. Fails miserably. And Jesus, and then just a few days later, he is preaching boldly at Pentecost, the, the exact opposite of what he had been before in denying Jesus. His ministry was the effectiveness. It's what I said last week when I was talking about my mom. We, we have this idea that... Um, Goodness is required to have an effective ministry. Not the fact of the matter is none of us are good. And um, the effectiveness of our ministry depends on our acknowledging our badness, as Peter did. Jesus commissioned him after his failure. This is the way Jesus is to those who betray him, to those who deny him, to those who mock him, to those who um, tortured him. To those who hung him on a cross, to those who accused him unjustly. I mean, he had every reason, to those who abused him, he had every reason and right in the world to retaliate, to get justice. And what does he say? Well, about the soldiers and those mocking him, forgive them, Father, they don't know what they're doing. To Peter, go feed, I love you. Go feed my sheep. You're now ready. Of course you're forgiven. Of course you're forgiven. You're, your slate is wiped clean. Now go. 
Go, go do what I have hardwired you and equipped you to do. This is his response. Okay, this is the mind blow. I mean, put yourself in, put yourself in his shoes. You've been betrayed by your friends. You've been abandoned. You've been unjustly accused. You've been abused. You've been beaten physically, physically beaten. Okay, you have been made fun of, mocked. You came from heaven to earth, God in the flesh, to rescue these people, to love these people, to forgive these people, to serve these people. And how do they repay you? How do they repay you? They betray you. They abandon you. They make fun of you. They beat you, and they kill you. They abuse you with their words. They abuse you with their hands, and they kill you. And his response is, forgive them. Forgive them. They, we, we hear that and we go, that's impossible. I know. <laughs> and what is impossible with us is possible with God because where we succumb to murderous rages every day in our hearts and minds, Jesus asks the Father to forgive those who have unjustly ridiculed and beaten him. I mean, I killed four people on the way to church this morning in my car. Literally, four people. I was running a little bit late, and no one else on the road seemed to be sensitive to that fact, okay? Um, All the people who typically drive fast are still recovering from last night in bed. All the people who drive slow and are scared to death uh, are on the road Sunday mornings, and so I killed four people this morning. Not literally with my car. I wouldn't want to dent my car. But in my mind, okay, every time I say something like this, Kim's like, don't say that. People are going to think you're a murderer. I am, okay, and so are you. That's the point, okay? Um, But I mean, I literally, um, I mean, I'm, I'm doing this in my mind all the time. When I'm treated badly, when I'm unjustly accused, when I feel betrayed, when I feel unloved, by someone who ought to love me, when I feel like I've been abandoned, at least emotionally, when I feel like um, my expectations are unmet because someone doesn't care, when I feel all of these things, okay, I mean, anger, frustration, my sense of entitlement rages within me. I mean, this, this happens all the time. And I, I was blessed to grow up in a family where my mom and dad loved me. They didn't abuse me. They loved me. They, they didn't take things away from me. They gave things to me. I was never, ever in doubt about the unquestioning love of my mom and my dad. And even though I joke about my brothers and sisters and say that our love language is sarcasm and we build each other up by tearing each other down, all in good fun, but I knew they loved me. I knew I loved them. I mean, I was, for the most part, surrounded by people who knew me and loved me my entire life. Some of you can't say that. I know some of your stories, and you're thinking to yourself, but you don't know. Okay, you don't know my background. You don't know my mom and dad. You don't know my husband. You don't know my wife, my ex-husband, my ex-wife. You don't know the way my kids make me feel. You don't know how disrespectful they are. You just, you don't know. Jesus does, and faced it all. He faced it all to a deepened degree that you and I will never face, ever. And his response is, forgive them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And he did this for us so that his record of perfect law keeping, both on the inside and outside, could be given to us could be given to us. It's what theologians call Christ's active obedience. They make a distinction between his active obedience and his passive obedience. His active obedience is him fulfilling the law in all of its detail so that his fulfillment of the law, the record of his fulfilling of the law would be given to us. His passive obedience is his dying for people like you and me, for people who have broken his demands, for people who have not fulfilled the law. So his active obedience is fulfilling it. His passive obedience is taking the judgment of not fulfilling it on himself. Jesus did, he responded this way 
for you and for me so that his record of perfect law keeping, not just on the outside, but on the inside, could be given to us. Every one of our murderous thoughts and desires are carried by Jesus to the cross. And listen to this, listen. And every one of his petitions for forgiveness is attributed to our lips. It's attributed to, that's, that's the record we now have. That's the record. When God looks at us, he doesn't, when God looks at those who are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, who have been given the record of Jesus, the perfect law-keeping record of Jesus, when God looks at us, he doesn't see some, you know, impatient punk driving to church, killing people on his way because he's running late. He sees Jesus saying, forgive them, for they know not how they drive, okay? Um, he's, I mean, he, he sees Jesus He sees Jesus asking his father to forgive his abusers. Where we cannot muster up the kind of forgiveness to forgive those around us for things that they have done to hurt us and we struggle with it and we wrestle with it and we say, I would love to feel the freedom that accompanies being able to forgive those who have treated me bad, but I just can't seem to get it. I might experience it in flashes and moments, but I still suffer from bitterness and I don't know what to do about it. God reminds us by preaching the gospel to us that All of the tenderness and forgiveness that Jesus spoke with his lips are now attributed to ours. That he does not look at us and evaluate us. Every, wherever God sees our failures, Jesus' successes trump those failures. That's, That's why the gospel is such good news. It's not about getting fixed. The gospel is not first good news because it promises transformation. It's good news because it promises substitution, which is a big, you like that, don't you? I do too. Um, That's our hope. Because otherwise, the gospel doesn't sound like good news if this whole thing is riding on our transformation. You'll still deal with anger. You'll still deal with bitterness. You're you're a broken person and you're living with other broken people, which means that you're still going to be mistreated and you're still going to respond to that mistreatment in ways that are far from perfect. So your transformation's not your hope. It's what my friend Mark Galley, who's the executive editor of Christianity Today, he said in one of his books, uh, if, if you've become a Christian because you want to get better, That's not love for God, that's love for self. (laughs) That's not what this whole thing is riding on, okay? This whole thing is riding on substitution. In my place, condemned he stood and sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a savior. That's, That's good news. The good news is not, okay, If you just focus on grace, you'll you'll be able to be a thousand times more forgiving than you were yesterday. Listen, I try, (laughs) you know? I I, I try, when I'm dealing with a lack of forgiveness for someone else, I have to stop and think about the forgiveness that God has given me and my offense to him is far greater than this person's offense to me. And I mean, that, that helps me not to be consumed by bitterness, but it doesn't, It doesn't rid me of the problem forever. Christ's record imputed to our account is what rids me of the problem forever. The condemnation that I deserve, that he took upon his shoulders. Jesus was murdered to pardon murderers. But think about this. In one sense, this is bad news because every one of us is as bad as a murderer, even the person who simply thinks for a split second that someone else is a fool is guilty before God as being a murderer and liable to hell. I mean, so in one sense it's bad news, but in another sense this is amazing news because even murder cannot separate us from the love of God because of what God in Christ has done for us. That's mind-blowing to me, okay? I mean, even murder, even murder, 
cannot separate us from God's love because of what Jesus has done for us. Jesus did not come for good people. He came for angry, vengeful, bitter killers like you and me. That's who he came for. He didn't come for good people. <laughs> there are no good people. I've said this before. I mean, Jesus, Jesus loves bad people because bad people are all that there are. I mean, Jesus, Jesus loves messed up people because messed up people are all that there are. And when we take his law seriously, we see just how messed up we are. And that raises our awareness of who Jesus is and what he has done and what he's accomplished on our behalf. And that fixes our eyes on him, the author and finisher of our faith. So let me just conclude by reading you this, this prayer, this old Puritan prayer. Don't know who wrote it. It's in a book of anonymous prayers. But the writer gets to the heart of substitution and what Jesus accomplished on behalf of killers like you and me and what we get in return. He says, Jesus was cast off that I might be brought in, trodden down as an enemy that I might be welcomed as a friend, surrendered to hell's worst that I might attain heaven's best, stripped that I might be clothed, wounded that I might be healed, tormented that I might be comforted, made a shame that I might inherit glory, entered darkness that I might have eternal life. My Savior wept so that all tears might be wiped from my eyes, groaned that I might have endless song, endured all pain that I might have unfading health, bowed his head that I might uplift mine, experienced reproach that I might receive welcome, closed his eyes in death that I might gaze on unclouded brightness. He expired that I might live forever. That's who he is. That's what he's done. And if you're, if you're here this morning and you have, for whatever reason, rejected the Christian faith, I'm pretty sure you haven't rejected this. You've rejected a moralistic caricature of what Christianity is all about. That Christianity is about good people who desperately want to get better that it's for clean people. There are no clean people. There are no good people. There is one who came to do for train wrecks like you and me what we could never do for ourselves. He has come to deliver freedom and help and peace where there is no peace. He's come to deliver comfort where there is no comfort. He constantly and perpetually meets our guilt with his grace our mess with his mercy, our failures with his forgiveness. That's who he is. That is the Jesus that maybe you've never known. That's, that's the one. That's the one who said, I have come to set the captives free. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you, not a to-do list, I will give you rest most glorious invitation of all invitations.